In Florida, the Dunham family moves into a home that seems ideal. But they soon find themselves under attack. An unseen enemy tries to drive them out, forcing them to fight a war against the world of the dead. Ah. And we're back. It's episode 44. A Haunting in Florida. Yes. This is a good one because uh, this one happened near to us, right up in Deltona, and... And involved a guy I know. Yeah, so this one, if you saw um, our last episodes, we did uh, the one that was about... What was the other ones we did? We did Haunting of Summer Summing Wind. Haunting of Summer Wind. We did, and then we uh, did the one that was uh, called The Dark Side. The Dark Side, yeah. Um, so, you know, what we're doing, like I said, we said we would probably do this, is we go to kind of, you know, regularly doing a haunting episodes that we liked and kind of talking about them and talking a little bit about the real stuff, you know, behind the case. Haunting in Florida was a good one. And I happen to know Ed Dunham, which yeah, so I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell the story kind of as it as it happened. Yeah, you know what I mean. But it was kind of an interesting, uh, interesting situation meeting Ed Dunham. Yeah, tried so to that, get tried to get him on the show, but he was busy. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of like the cool the cool thing about this one, and actually the kind of cool thing about it was even when we first saw it on the show was that. It happened in Deltona, which actually I don't, you know, I don't know if a lot of you know this, but I am a Florida native and I was actually born in Daytona Beach, Florida. And we now and we now live in Orlando and Deltona is right in between those two things. So I grew up about 20 miles from where this took place. And uh, you've actually seen the ha- the actual yeah, house. I'm not, he's not going to say where it is. But I'm not going to say where it is, but I, I, I know where it is and I rode by it and <clears throat> looked at it. I didn't go in. Somebody else is in it now, but I, I know where it is. Yeah, I didn't get any weird feelings from the place. But let's do let's go ahead and do the uh do our intro and then uh we'll start talking about the case. Yeah. All so right. we'll just do at first, you know, we're going to do like we usually do, going to do our little housekeeping and um give props to the Project Entertainment Network and Armand Rosamilia who runs it. And uh you know, we've been doing pretty good on there, getting a lot of downloads and yeah, show's picking gro- up a lot of new sh- listeners and show show on the podcast is growing exponentially. Not yeah. so much on the YouTube. It's just a steady growth on the YouTube. Yeah. But uh, you know, if you're on if you're on the podcast, please uh subscribe to the YouTube so we know exactly how many of you guys are. And if you need to contact us, you can always leave a comment right there. And you can also uh friend us on Facebook. Yep. It's a uh, thirteen o'clock podcast, Facebook. And uh also let's see what else. Um usually like I usually do, I'm gonna mention my newest book, The Unseen Hand. Selling well. And it's selling well. And if you would like a copy, obviously it's available in print, ebook and audio book. The SPR asked for a copy. Yes. And that, you sent them one, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Um, I sent them a I sent them a PDF, and I'm also sending them a print copy. Oh, you sent them a for print their copy archives. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's going to be a while before they get it because shipping. Okay, good. If any of you guys know who overseas the SPR, shipping, the SPR has been around for a long time. Yeah, over a hundred years, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's Britain's version of the Talamasca. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. And also, I think the only other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, and I think I mentioned this, we mentioned this last week or the week before, that we are going to be at Spooky Empire in Orlando, big horror convention. It's the weekend before Halloween, uh, October 27th, 28th, and 29th. Mm-hmm. And we will be there all three days. We're on the author track. We're going to be on a bunch of the panels. We'll be there selling books. So if you are in the Orlando area at the end of October and want to see us in person, then you can do that. And you can come over and talk to us and have your picture taken and we'll sign stuff for you and all that kind of neat stuff. I'll probably give you something to drink, too. Yes, and we yeah. might also have booze. We might you, have If booze. you ask very yeah. nicely. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, that's probably all we wanted to mention. At the yeah, let's so let's kind of get into let's the, get case. the case. Now... Like I said, since this was a haunting in Florida and it happened very close to where I grew up, it's funny because when you say that you're from Florida, I think people that have never been here like have a particular um, kind of maybe an idealized view of it. I don't know if it's idealized in a positive way or a negative way, but I guess because of Disney World and because it's a big vacation destination and stuff like that, I think people have certain ideas about it. Yeah, foreigners tend to to think that this is a touristy area. 
Yeah, which Orlando, parts of Orlando are. The tourist areas. The tourist areas. Now, what a lot of people don't know, too, is that Disney World and all the parks and stuff like that are not actually in Orlando. No, it's outside. It's kind of outside of Orlando. I mean, downtown Orlando is just like a regular city, pretty much. And we know so many people that work in those places. I mean, those are just regular jobs for around here. Yeah, because, yeah, there are so many people, especially like creative people in creative fields and stuff like that. One of our good friends, actually, was Minnie Mouse. Yeah. The underneath all that costume, you wouldn't know, but. <laughs> yeah, she worked as Minnie Mouse for a long yeah. time. But uh, yeah, so we've known a lot of people that have worked at the parks and stuff like that. So we know all the dark stories about them. Yeah. But also what a lot of people don't Disney's know too. Cult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. And actually speaking of Disney World, do you, do you know, and actually I didn't really know this because I'd never heard these stories, but the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disney World and the Haunted Mansion mm-hmm. are supposed to be like haunted for real. Yeah. Both haunted by... Uh, ghosts of people that used to work there, like yeah. employees that got killed on the job or were killed and wanted to spend nothing their afterlife not, there. Another thing not known is that Disney princesses are nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, let's let's not go into that. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Okay, but um, yeah, but the, the, but other than Disney World, there's actually like a lot of really cool like haunted kind of history around in this area. Some of it has to do with St. Augustine, which again, I don't know if you guys know, it's not terribly far from here. It's about 30, 40 miles from where I grew up in Daytona. And uh, it's actually the oldest city in the United States. It was founded by the Spanish in 1565, 1585, 1585. And uh, that's got all kind of ghosts, like walking around the in the cemeteries and then the fort. There's a big fort there. According Castillo de San Yes, and there's According ghost tours local. and stuff like that. Even where I grew up, in Daytona, the Boot Hill Saloon, which is like a big biker mecca, yeah. is supposedly uh, has a poltergeist infestation. I'd go check that out. Yeah, you should. It's a. Yeah. It's actually. It's right across the street from a big, really cool cemetery that's in Daytona. Because that's that's actually Boot Hill's. Um, their little uh, slogan is "Order a drink and have a seat. You're better Another off here than the, across the street." The main biker hangout that I know cemetery. is the Cabbage Patch. Yeah, is that's it near the Cabbage Patch. No, it's not near the. Um, actually, Boot Hill is in the older part of Daytona, like on uh, Main Street. All right. Cabbage Patch is kind of outside of the city a little I bit. I know where it is, but I don't know where they relate to. Yeah, it's like a little bit outside. Um, yeah, Boot Hill is like where is over on the other side of the bridge. Okay, let's stay back on target because we're veering away. We're veering. All away right. Oh, I also wanted to mention Casadega too, which is okay. like a spiritualist community still there, it's supposed to be haunted, and also yeah. there's the thing called the Devil's Chair. That if yeah. you sit in it, the devil will talk to you. And I got one of those. <laughs> you have a devil's chair. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the episode of A Haunting that we're talking about today actually aired as part of it was season two, which aired in 2006. And it was called A Haunting in Florida, which is interesting because it was a very straightforward title. A lot of episodes of A Haunting didn't really have very straightforward titles. They always yeah. had something like Echoes from the Grave or something like well, that. Well, it was still early on. I think it was first season. Yeah. Yeah. So it actually just kind of had more of a title that... I'm pretty sure it's first season. It's first season, right? Second season. Second season? It's the okay. second season, right. yeah. Still early in the in a haunting in the series. Run. Yeah. And again, I think and I think it's another thing that I liked about this one that's similar to the one how we talked about on the Dark Side Haunting episode is because it's pretty low-key. Like, yeah. not a lot of crazy shit happens. There's well, not like, it, it did in the end, but we'll get to it in a minute. Right, but it, it's not yeah. like, oh, it's demons, it's this, right. it's that. You know, it wasn't this big crazy thing. Okay, so basically well, this... Before we start off, I'm going to say, I've met Ed Dunham. Yes. And I believe Ed Dunham's story. All right, but I'm just right off the top. I don't believe everything other people had to say about this, but we'll get to it and to the point. Yeah. But I, uh, I, I believed Ed was credible. Well, from, one from... thing that I, that I saw, like I've never met him in person, you have. Yeah. One thing that came across on the show when he was being interviewed was he did come across as very believable. Yeah, and he's just like that in person. Yeah. When you meet him in person, he's just like that. He's, he's actually kind of like a big gregarious kind of guy. Yeah. yeah he's kind of a larger-than-life type of character. And he's a big dude. Yeah. He's not a little guy. Well, he was dude, a yeah. U.S. Army Ranger. He's an Army right? Ranger, and I'm ex-infantry, so we immediately hit it, hit it off. I yeah. was airborne infantry, and he's he's Ranger. Yeah. And he's not just a regular tabbed guy. He was a bat boy. He was in the 75th Infantry. He was in the Ranger Regiment. Yeah. So, you know, which is a long story. Veterans know what I'm talking about. And like I said, he does not seem like the type of dude who would just make stuff up or would imagine things uh, to this extent. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so he this, did come across It's a good very, story. Yeah. Yeah. He story. did come across as very credible. Right. So the, Something happened there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, the episode aired in 2006, but it actually occurred in 2001. Now, what ended up happening, he was married to a woman named Beth at the time. He had a son uh, who was 12 at the time named Matt from his previous marriage. And him and Beth also had a daughter together named Emily, who I believe was, she was still a toddler. She was like one or two. And they um, they were looking for a new house because, you know, the they were running out of room and they wanted a bigger house. So Ed had been working in like construction or house renovation or something like that. And Which somebody, he still does. I, he's still in construction. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So somebody that he had done some work for in the past said, oh, I, I have a house in Deltona that... Um, Guy that just I, left it. Yeah, well, he's like, you can rent to own. Right. Now, yeah. see, I'm not real sure because they weren't real clear on the show whether the guy that told him about the house owned the house. Right. Or whether he was serving as a middleman for someone. I didn't get into that when I was talking to him, so I don't know either. Yeah, because they don't really make it clear right. on the show. From the show, it seemed like the guy who told him about the house... It was his house. Okay. And he's like, I'll let you rent to own it because I know you guys are looking okay. for a house. All right. Okay. So they get this house. It's in Deltona. Now, I don't know where they moved from. I don't know if they were from the area or anything like that previous to that. It's not included in the story. Yeah. It so doesn't really matter. The story. Okay. Now, the first weird thing happens. And this, this is kind of like another thing where like on a haunting where it's nothing supernatural has happened yet. But s- shit like this creeps me out. It was just like the the one that we were talking about with some with uh with Summer Wind or whatever it was, where or it wasn't Summer Wind. It was another it was one. The one with the family. It was the one with the yeah. family where they come in and there was a family like, only living in there and they right. lived down there. Like right. that creeps me the fuck out, right? Right. This also creeped me the fuck out. He comes to the house with the wife and the family to show her the house and saying, you know, do you want to do this and stuff like that. They get in the house. All the furniture is still there, which isn't super weird, but. It doesn't look like anyone has made any attempt to move out. There's like, there's yeah. garbage, there's newspapers there was a, open. There was on, a half eaten plate of food. There was a half eaten plate of food in yeah. the kitchen. It looked like somebody had just been living their life and then just got up and left or yeah. just disappeared. Yeah, and Ed, Ed thought it was strange when he first saw it. That is strange. Yeah. I mean, I would be really creeped out if I right. went in a house that someone said, oh, yeah, here's a house you can have and yeah. stuff like that. And then there's like a half eaten food plate yeah. in the kitchen and there's like, spoiled food in the fridge or yeah. you know there was old food in the fridge or something like that that seemed really strange and yeah, from, he from what i remember ed thought it was strange but he was rationalizing all this ed's a real nuts and bolts kind of guy yeah. he's not he's not in the supernatural shit he just thought guy just up and ran yeah basically and you know, know like he said because the house was such a good deal and because they were going to yeah. let him rent to own and it was a nice house. It was in a nice neighborhood, his wife said on there. Um, she, she's not his wife anymore, but she was at the time. It was at the time, yeah. You know, she said that it was a nice neighborhood and, and, you know, they had to take it. So he basically said, oh, well, the guy who said whose house it was said he would pay us to box up the stuff or clean up the house or whatever. And we could use whatever's here. He doesn't want it anymore. Right. Okay. You know, weird, but he's like, okay, well, that it'll just have to do because it's too good a deal and we can't let it go. So they move in. Everything seems fine at first, as it usually does. Was that thunder? That was thunder. Oh, my goodness. Damn. Okay. Florida. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard that, but yeah, it was really loud. So the first thing that happened was just little shit. The first thing is his wife, Beth, she's in the back. It looked like um, in the reenactment, it kind of looked like a, you know, like a screen porch, like a lot of Florida houses have. She said she felt like someone was out in the backyard watching her. Yeah. And this and she, you know, she said that the feeling was really really strong. Like she's like, "God, man, I feel like somebody's out there like yeah. looking in the windows." And, you know, so she tells Ed about it and of course he's just kind of like, "Oh, you know, it's no big deal, but I'll put some blinds up tomorrow." Right. So, you know, in case there really is somebody out there, they, you know, they can't see in. That was just the first thing. Now, the weird thing is that the second thing that happened was actually kind of a big deal. What ended up happening, this was only a couple nights later, Ed says he's sleeping and he wakes up because he smells smoke. Yeah. And he flips out because he thinks the house is on fire. So he wakes his wife up. He says, go get the baby. And it's like, you know, and I'm going to go find, you know, there's a fire. Yeah. So he starts running down the hallway looking for where the fire is. Now, while he's walking down the hallway, he sees something out of the corner of his eye and he backs up. And he looks in one of the bedrooms and there's a guy sitting on the bed smoking a cigar. Yeah. 
And he said, now he doesn't say this on the show, but he said this to you, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, I, I talked to him about it for a man, good 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. About that particular episode. He said it looked like as real as me and you. He said it just yeah. looked like a man was sitting on the bed. It's like, and he didn't seem like, he didn't seem like he just glanced at it or no. into it. He said he looked right at it. Yeah, he said that he said that when he looked at that guy sitting at the bed at the edge of the bed, that guy made eye contact with him and he felt the recognition pass between the two. That not only was that was that guy was he looking at that guy, that guy was looking at him and knowing and that guy knew. You know what I mean? When you have that yeah. moment of recognition. And he said the guy looked uh hostile. That he looked hostile. You yeah. Know, that from what I remember that we said. He said he got a really bad feeling about the guy. Yeah. Which actually he, he didn't mention that on the show. No, he got a real bad feeling about the guy and he flipped out and attacked. Yeah. He attacked, but the guy vanished. Yeah, like in the in the reenactment, they kind of showed him like looking at the guy shocked and the guy looking back at him, like with the cigar, and then like he kind of moves toward the guy, like, Who are you? or something like yeah. that. And then his wife comes up behind him, is like, "Where's the fire?" And he looks at the wife. He turns around to look at her. And when he look, he goes, "There's somebody in here." And when he looked back to, to the at, at the bed, the guy was gone. The guy was gone. And and the wife didn't believe him. Not at first. The wife thought that he was sleepwalking. Yeah. From what I remember, that's what that's what Ed told me. She said. Yeah. That she thought he was sleepwalking, but he said that it was just real. He told me it was just like you know, and this was like veteran to veteran shit. You know what I mean? I was. I was buying what he was saying. He saw it. Yeah. And and that that guy looked at him, which that's a so weird, like I said, really it's weird. it's not kind of a thing. It doesn't seem like a thing where he just saw somebody out of the corner of his eye, yeah. or it's like I saw a shadow or something like that. He apparently looked right at this dude. Yeah, and in the episode, the guy's vaguely blue colored. I think. Yeah, but he still looks pretty solid though. He doesn't. Yeah, look- Ed didn't mention that. He just said the guy. The guy just had kind of an ominous air to him you know so i guess that's how they how they tried to express that in the episode yeah he didn't say that it didn't say the guy was blue yeah he just said the guy had a really yeah. ominous presence yeah he didn't actually say the guy looked ghostly at all he uh-huh. said it looked like a real guy yeah, he, he thought it was a guy yeah and i think <clears> he <throat> told me oh you know what man i wish i had recorded that phone call but yeah. i didn't have permission to you know i was just talking to him you know yeah uh if i remember correctly he thought that guy was wet he was all in like denim jeans and like a, a flannel shirt and that he was sopping wet, if I remember correctly. Oh, I remember you telling yeah, me that. Yeah. Because they didn't put that on the show. No. And, and he didn't say that on the show. If I remember correctly, he told me the guy was like sopping wet with like a, a bunch of stuff like around his pant legs, like grass and stuff and stuck to his pant legs huh. and everything. I wonder if he said that. Like, like he had been outside. I wonder if he said that like on the show interview and they edited it out. Although you'd think that they would leave that in because that's, pre- pre- that's pretty spooky. Ed's on my friends list. He's going to be hearing this show. If I've got that part wrong, he can go ahead and comment in the comment section yeah. here because I'm going to show him this show. Yeah. Yeah. I think I remember you telling me that yeah, he said I think that if though. If I remember correctly, told but me I the, could guy, also the guy was wet. Did. Yeah. If I remember correctly. Okay. So yeah. So he says, I saw a guy. There was a guy in here and his wife's just like, whatever. I'm going back to bed. There's no fire. So that And you woke me up for nothing pretty much. She, and actually she seemed kind of pissy about it on the yeah. show too. She was kind of like, uh, whatever. Yeah. Like a little while later, Beth gets pregnant again. At this point, after Beth tells him that she's pregnant again, and they're kind of happy about it, you know, but they don't have a ton of money, but they're, you know, she's kind of like, oh, it's a good thing. And it's a good thing. After that, it seemed like the phenomena ramped up some. Mm-hmm. And Beth even said that, I think, that um, that she thought it had ramped up once she found out she was pregnant. Now, she, um, like I said, they had a toddler. And so she was pregnant and she was getting tired all the time and stuff like that. So when the toddler was, would be put down for a nap, she would take a nap. Okay, so one afternoon, she's taking a nap. She wakes up. And she sees an old woman in a house dress standing at the end of the bed. Yeah. I'm not really sure. Like, from the reenactment, it was hard to tell. I don't think she initially thought it was a ghost. I think she just thought it was some crazy homeless lady or something like that. She just thought it was an old lady. She just thought it was an old lady that was in her house. Yeah. So she jumps out of bed. She picks up the phone. She calls out at work and says, there's somebody in the house. There's somebody in the house. But when she turns around, the lady's gone. Right. So... Ed gets home and she's like, you know, I just saw this woman and and she describes the woman to Ed. Yeah. And Ed says, that sounds, that like, sounds like, just like, like my, my mom. mom. Yeah. And his mom had just passed away a few years before that, if I remember correctly. Yeah, she had cancer, I believe. Yeah. 
And so Ed thinks it's kind of cool. He's like, oh, maybe my mother's ghost is coming back to like look over you since yeah. you're going to have a baby and stuff like that. And his wife is just kind of like, no. she scared the <laughs> shit out of me. I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. Which I don't, you know, I don't blame her. It's like, right. I don't want some creepy, like ghostly old lady <laughs> looking at me while I'm sleeping. She's like, that's not protective. She's like, she's just creeping yeah. me out. At this if I point, remember like, correctly, though, he wasn't really so sure if that's who it was. He was, yeah, he just thought it sounded and, like and his, if, if his I, mom. Yeah, yeah. If I remember correctly, he was still kind of like partially in doubt about what exactly was going on in the house. He was kind yeah. of in denial, I think, still at that point. Because the more I found out about the case, the more I talked about him. You find out that you know Ed's kind of has a hard time communicating what it is. He doesn't like to talk about it. Yeah, too much. Yeah, but we'll get into that. And later. yeah, they did do a little bit of that on the show too, right. because he seems like he's a very matter of fact person. He was in the military. He's but he yeah. doesn't like he likes being yeah able to control a situation. Right, paranormal is not his thing. Yeah, yeah, it's not his thing because and yeah. I think he even said this explicitly on the show in some of his interviews a few times. He's like, you know, I can't, you know, he's like, you can't do something about this yeah you can't do anything about you can't defend yourself against something that's invisible that you can't yeah. grab a hold of and i think it, w it was making him very angry and it was making him very yeah. frustrated that all this stuff was happening to his wife and his kid and stuff like that and he couldn't felt like he couldn't yeah. do anything when you're in the infantry it. when you're in the infantry and the rangers are elite infantry all right one of the things they bring out of you kind of like in your in, in your in your training through your conditioning is to bring out aggression when something goes wrong fight it yeah well that doesn't work with ghosts yeah. You know, you can't grab a hold of it. You can't control it. So that would make, that would make you feel, and I've been in the situation, it makes you feel very impotent. Yeah. And guys like that, alpha type guys, don't ever want to be impotent. Yeah. You know, they want to control it or fix it. Yeah. And you can't fix it. Yeah. Not this way. And you could really Not with your see. Fists. Or maybe yeah. Kim Jong un can fix ghosts <laughs> with his fists. <laughs> But, but uh, not the average mortal man. Yeah, and you can actually see this in his interviews. You could see that he was very frustrated with the whole situation and stuff, like, as you would be. Yeah. And, but particularly someone of that personality yeah, type. And it, yeah, and it, it intensifies. Yeah. The... So basically, okay, so the wife, after she sees the ghost, she's like, she's not so jazzed about being in the house anymore, especially when Ed isn't at home. So she starts taking the baby out for walks and kind of trying to start to stay out of the house as much as possible because she's creeped out by being in there. So one day she's had the baby out for a walk. She comes into the house to get the baby some more juice and she's given the baby some juice and then she turns around. All the cabinets in the kitchen are open suddenly. She's kind of wigging out. And then she closes all of the cabinets like being a, like, oh man, I don't need this shit right now. And then she hears the shower running. Yeah. And now she knows no one else is supposed to be home. But of course, you know, she thinks, oh, maybe Ed came home and is taking a shower mm -hmm. and he came home without me knowing. But you can still tell she was kind of like freaked out. And she's like, oh, man, I don't want to check this out. But she goes down the hall and sees she hears the shower running. The shower curtain is closed. And then she goes in the bathroom. And she's like, Ed, is that you? The water goes off. And then she opens the curtain and there's nobody there. Yeah. So at this point, she run, she's like, fuck this shit. She runs right. back to the kitchen and all the cabinet doors are open again. Right. So then at this point, she just kind of throws the juice at the baby and she's like, fuck this again. And she's out of there. Right. When Ed gets home from work that day, he finds Beth and the baby still outside. She's like, I'm not going in there. Right. She was sitting outside all afternoon until he got back home. At this point, I would probably, if I was in this case at this point, I would probably suspect just classic poltergeist. Yeah. There is a young kid in in the mix that is of the right age. Yeah. But he's he doesn't not, live with them. Doesn't live with them, and he doesn't seem to actually be the focus. Usually, yeah. in a true poltergeist case, is the kid is the focus. So that would lead, that would lead me to believe that this is some kind of a, what people would call a haunting. Yeah. Possibly an interactive haunting. But I don't know. There, there hasn't really been any hardcore interaction at this point other than seeing an apparition that looks at you and seems to recognize you. Maybe yeah. you might consider that interaction. But yeah. It seems like haunting at this yeah. point. Because I should note, too, that the old woman that Beth said she saw, she said that woman looked right at her, yeah. too. So it wasn't just like they were seeing some ghostly figure like flitting mm. through the room or whatever. They yeah. These seem like, if they are ghosts, they seem like they're... Right. 
they're they know that they're there and they know that you're there. Yeah. Now, personally, I've never seen a haunting or or been you know I've, I've no, seen me a, neither. a poltergeist event, but not a haunting. Yeah. So I can't vouch for the validity. We can only go with what other people say that yeah. they see during hauntings. Yeah. And listening to Ed, something happened there. Something uh, very strange yeah, seemed to have yeah, gone on. Yeah, probably a haunting. If if there is such a thing as haunting, this may be a good candidate at this point. Yeah. Okay, because of all this stuff happening, and most of it is happening to Beth at this point because Ed is out of the house. So, you know, at this point they're starting to fight a lot because he's like, well, just maybe it's probably just my mom and don't they haven't hurt you. So, you know, try to just ignore it or try to, but, you know, she is not really having it. She's like, you don't have to deal with it. I'm here all day. It's freaking me out. I don't like being in the house. But she doesn't really want to move because they both really like the house and it's, you know, they can't really afford it and stuff like that. You know, they kind of reach an impasse where there's like, we don't really know what we're going to do about it. Now, at this point, um, as I said, Ed had another son named Matt, uh, who was uh, 12 years old at the time in 2001. And he just stays with them on the weekends. So this one weekend, Matt comes there. He's like sleeping out what looked like the back, it looked like the back porch, but I guess it was like a sunroom or something like that. So Matt was sleeping on a couch out there. He was out there watching TV. I'm not sure they did interview Matt, who was, you know, now grown up, obviously, but um, I, he didn't say exactly what he saw. In the reenactment, they showed him sitting there and him being creeped out like he felt like someone was looking in the window, like his yeah. mother, like his uh, stepmother had. And then he heard a voice saying his name. Yeah. And then they showed his face and he was like kind of wigging out and he kind of looked behind him and the same guy that that ed had seen sitting on the bed kind of walked through the room right and matt kind of wigged now matt said that he didn't tell ed or beth what he had seen okay because beth apparently tried to get him to say because matt was freaked out and she was like what'd you see what'd you see and he's like, I, I didn't right. see anything. I was, you know, what you know what I mean? And then Beth was like, you know, because Ed was like, well, I don't want to involve him, and I don't want him to know what's going on in here. And Beth is like, well, maybe he shouldn't stay here mm-hmm. if this haunting shit is going on because we don't know if it's dangerous. You know, we don't right. want to put your put the children in harm's way any more than we have to and stuff. So they had fights about that. Right. So. So there's tension building up in the house. Yeah, so there's various tensions building up in the house. Okay, so Matt was only there for the weekend. He saw this thing and he didn't tell anybody at the time. And he goes back home. Now, a few nights later, they wake up and they hear noises in the house. And Ed said that it sounded like someone was dragging a body, like either down the halls or on the roof or something like that. And he starts looking around, but of course he can't find anything. Now, as I said before, you know, Ed is this big dude. He's an army ranger and stuff like that. And he's frustrated that he can't do anything about this. And so he just starts yelling at the ghost, just get out of my house. Stop, you know, stop messing with my pregnant wife. And it's like, why don't you mess with me? And all this other kind of stuff and getting super aggressive toward him. And, um, you know, Beth is just like, you know, please don't do that. You're probably just going to make him mad. You know, you're just right. antagonizing or something he like that. He goes into attack mode whenever the thing appears. Yeah, pretty much. And, um, when you know. I, when, when anything manifests, I think there's also walking on the ceiling. There's a couple Yeah, of that things. does come along later. But, yeah. So, at this point, they're just like, they're hearing all right. these noises like somebody and they can't find anything. So, at this point, he decides that he doesn't know what to do about this. So, he's going to call a paranormal research group for some help. Yeah. So he does the inevitable Google search yeah. and comes up with a paranormal group. Yeah, and it was local to, to Deltona. Well, it was correct. from Daytona Beach. From Daytona it was Beach, Daytona that's Daytona Beach. Close, yeah, that's it's close. it's very close. It's only right. 15, 20 miles apart. Right. Okay, so and that actually, was another that was actually another time. Had he done that now, he did it had he would have had one of the television series over there probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But um Which actually may have been even worse than it turned out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, not that it turned out that great anyway. It but didn't yeah. turn out good. No. No. Okay. So, not from my point of view, we're at the halfway point now. So, we're going to take a break and then we will come back and we'll talk about the paranormal team and we'll talk about all the stuff that happened. Yeah, the paranormal team. <laughs> What's happened after that? Okay. So, we'll be back in just a minute. It was a time when we raced to the TV guide to see what was playing on Monster Movie Matinee that Saturday afternoon and in some cities that evening. It was all about werewolves vampires, giant lizards, and those great Japanese monster movies. Relive it all every week as Jim Adams and Mark Maddox bring you Monster Attack, 
Monster Attack takes a look at those classic monster movies that we all grew up loving. Join us every week on Monster Attack, exclusively on the Project Entertainment Network. Subculture Corsets and Clothing is our favorite store for unusual clothing, shoes, and accessories. They offer a wide selection of men's and women's clothing at great prices. Subculture also offers a cool selection of shoes and accessories. Steampunk, gothic apparel, retro, corsets, and so much more at Subculture Corsets and Clothing. Check out Subculture online at subculturecorsets.com. That's subculturecorsets.com. Make sure you use the discount code 13 o'clock for a 10% discount. Subculturecorsets.com or visit their store in Jacksonville, Florida, just off I-95. The Necrocasticorn. The podcast that blends horror and heavy metal properties with a common connection. Brought to you by hosts, Talking Tom Clock, Max Axe, Smoking Wart Hades, and Azriel Mordecai. Featuring interviews and more with the stars of metal and horror. The Necrocasticon, Mondays on Project Entertainment Network. we're back now at this point ed decides like he said this is too big for him to handle i'm going to call somebody that ostensibly knows what's going on so he calls well actually what he does he does ooh, he doesn't call um them directly he goes to the paranormal daytona beach paranormal research group i think they're called and he posts like a message on their website yeah which actually leads him in contact with several teams and i think they're they're all kind of have a different mo- uh, different take on the case if I remember correctly right well no well, um they, they on this work, one they were working together as a team because I remember yeah. some disagreement in certain key aspects that I'll get into later but no the only well what ended up and it ended up happening later was another psychic but actually I think they were kind of in agreement on, on okay. what ended up on, happening. in the big picture they were in yeah the, oh, well whatever but so what ended up happening he posts a message on this website and he gets a um he gets an email from a woman named Dusty Smith um, who is a paranormal investigator from Daytona Beach. And she says, call me and we'll talk about this. And so he calls her up. After explaining, you know, what was going on, so Dusty says, well, I'm going to get a team out there and we'll see what we can see. So it only took a couple days. She gets her team together and they go out there. Now, Ed has said, and I think maybe a lot of people that don't know much about quote unquote paranormal investigation or kind of think this, like if you have all this horrible like haunting shit going on in your house, mm. it's almost like they feel like, oh, well, if I call a paranormal research group, then it'll fix the problem. Like, yeah. it'll get rid of the haunting. He's picturing it'll... Ghostbusters. He yeah, wants them that's to fix what it. I mean. He, You know, it's to just it's just like, you know, right. when you call the any kind of repair person and they right. come to your house, they fix the shit, they leave, you know, and right. stuff like that. So I think that's what he was expecting. Yeah. And they even, they had uh, the real Dusty Smith on there and she was talking and she kind of said that too. She's like, well, she kind of, you know, they kind of felt like we were just going to come out there and wave a magic wand and everything was going to go away. And so she had to explain to them, she's like, look, we have to do a lot of research. We have to do a lot of uh, investigation before we figure out what's going on in your house and how we can get rid of it. So while they're at, while the team are at the house, they're interviewing the witnesses and Beth is telling them, you know, I think it got worse after I found out I was pregnant and like, you know, Ed's yelling at the ghosts and it seems like it's making it worse or something like that. Now, while they're interviewing them, they suddenly all hear, evidently, banging on the walls that, you know, obviously there's no explanation for. And then on their um, on their instruments, they notice the temperature in the house like drops a lot. So, and and then starts kind of wildly fluctuating. I think a lot of the EMF readings were fluctuating wildly too, like as they were walking around the house and uh, figuring stuff out. Now, so they thought that was kind of weird and they documented and stuff like that. Now they're walking around the house and Ed is telling them where he saw the first apparition of the guy with the cigar. Now, while they're in that area, evidently Dusty is standing in the hallway where Ed was standing when he saw the guy and she says that she felt something 
pull her head back by her hair, like really suddenly. Yeah. So <clears throat> she says, okay, there's a lot of, uh, you know, activity in this hallway. So we're going to set up the EVP meters and stuff like that. I don't know, like, you know, the, the thing about the show A Haunting it differs from Paranormal Witness and that Paranormal Witness, if there was actually any quote unquote real evidence captured on the case, like photographs, they'll, or show, it. they'll show it or they'll play it. A haunting doesn't really do that. No, that's a problem with the So, with the yeah. So you never know, you know, so you have Dusty Smith on there saying, you know, oh, we captured EVPs. Oh, we did this and that. It, but, but where is it? Where is it? You know, they, they don't it. show it. Right. I mean, it's not like it might be on their website. I don't know. I didn't look, right. but you know what I mean. And then they, how the case wraps up and why it, why it wraps up kind of infuriates me because the team is claiming to 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 basically hit the jackpot, but they don't want to cash in on it. They won't yeah. show you the jackpot, which we'll get into that in a bit. Yeah. So evidently, so after all this happens, they they you know record in the hallway. They take all their data or something like that, and they say, okay, well we're gonna go through all the data, and then we'll be back in a few days or whatever. So the following day, Dusty goes um, to get pull property records on the house because she wants to find out, you know, who's to live there, who's owned it, blah, blah, blah. Now, she discovers that the house has been sold many times in the past few years. Like people haven't lived there for very long before selling it. And it always sells for way less than other houses in the neighborhood, you know, leading some to believe that maybe there's something the matter with it or other people have experienced hauntings as well. I've seen the actual house, though. I didn't see anything unusual with that. No. It was a very common kind of house yeah. for that area in a time when houses were kind of changing hands pretty quickly. I don't think that was unusual, but... Yeah, you know. but they did mention it on there. Right. And, you know, they and also it's, brought it's, up... It's not the house pictured, of course. It's a, the, the actual house is a lot more humble than that. And it's in, it's in a, a decent neighborhood. It's just that it's, it's, it's an older neighborhood. Most of those houses look like they're made in the 60s. Yeah, which is, I I can imagine, because I've been through Deltona many times, so so I know what kind of uh, neighborhood. It's probably similar to the neighborhood I grew up in. Right. But, um, you know, so also they kind of also explore the sacred land to the Native Americans angle, because they always have to do that. And... um, (laughs) Which you know it might be. It's we had Seminole Indians. We had we had various uh, tribes and whatnot. Stop blaming those but Indians. I know those poor Indians. Yeah. They, they get blamed for every single haunting in America. I'm sorry, you guys. We don't really. But um, you know, we know it's not all your fault. It never could be those dead Irishmen or all those dead Germans near the railroads, could it? No, I don't. No, it, yeah. It, 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 and all the dead Chinese is. underneath the damn railroad tunnels. Yeah, why isn't it ever? I don't know. You never hear about like ghost speaking Chinese because like, their ever. souls don't don't ever be, don't ever uh, become unrested. I guess, I guess so. I guess they're just like fuck this. Yeah. I'm out. But <laughs> ethnic <laughs> yeah. hauntings. I guess ethnic hauntings. Okay, let's let's move along. It's all we're having here. Okay, okay. So evidently, Dusty listens to the tapes that she recorded at the house, and she said. She heard a bunch of EVPs suggesting a bunch of different voices, like they were a bunch of different spirits, right? Now, she said that she couldn't understand what any of them were saying. She also did note from the property records that at least two people had died either in the house or while they were living at the house. One of these was a younger man or, you know, a middle-aged man, just like the guy with the cigar. And the other was an old woman. Now, you researched the, this part, right? Was there any, you know, I mean, like, was this evidence ever shown that people died? There, I'm just or was saying it just claimed? That's, it was it's just claimed. claimed. The, right. the, because of the death records. Okay. Like I said, I don't know if the people actually died in the house or, or if they just the died area. or if they just died while they happened to own the house or what have you. But anyway, that was... that well, That's was, happened in this house. That's what I mean. Okay. That ha- well, right. that's what, see, that's another thing where I was like, oh, somebody died in the house. I'm like, yeah, somebody's died everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> people know? die every day. They're every, you know, usually they die in the hospital. Yeah. And those people that were in that house when they died probably didn't die in that house. They they went to the hospital and died. That's what I mean. So that's, that's kind that, of what yeah. I... Yeah. Yeah, that's when what I mean. you've been around as long as us, Jenny, we've seen lots of people die. through natural causes and accidents and things like that. And it's yeah. really not that scary. And it's not that dramatic. Yeah, not really. They go to the hospital, they get sick, you know they're not coming back. A few days later, they're gone. Yeah. And the thing is, And the too, houses do not become ominous or no. haunting. Well, and the thing, too, haunted. is that, honestly, if if people were... And, like, I know that paranormal people say that, oh, it's not always... Go- the ghost of everybody doesn't come back, because otherwise right, yeah. we would just be ass deep in ghosts all the time. Right. But even if the house is haunted, like, somebody's died on the land underneath your house, for sure. Yeah. I mean, considering all the people that have died in yeah. the history of the earth. Right. 
you know, I'm sure all kinds of people have died on the little right. patch of land that your house is on yeah. before the house was there. My dad lives in Mississippi. All yeah. Right? And, he, and he has hunt, he has hunting rights on a certain piece of land. That and but that land is actually owned by the Masonite Corporation, which is a logging company. Right. All right. He was out there putting up deer stands, you know, little shooting houses, what they call them, and cutouts. And you would find old medicine bottles from the 1800s. We were digging one, and I said, "Look at that man! It's a piece of a plate. What's that doing here?" My dad said, "There was a town here." I was like, "What?" He says, "Yeah, there was a town here in the 1800s, and it looks like you're out in the middle of nowhere." Yeah. And this is Mississippi, rural as hell. And he's like, "Every tree." In Mississippi has been planted at one time or another, you know, and maybe it's descendants of planted trees. And pretty much every square acre had something on it at one time or another. This land has been used and reused many times over. So there is no real virgin territory in most of the U.S. If you're living in that area, somebody else usually was living in that area. At some point in the past. At some point or at some point in the past. And even now, like like you said, even if there's nothing there now, Mm -hmm. it might have been like some big bustling town center at some point in the past italy is built on a massive graveyard yeah italy is just stacked and you'd be alarmed dead people you would be alarmed at how not long it takes yeah for nature to kind of reclaim it just reclaims it all the stuff that you know yeah. if you've ever seen that show like life after people or yeah. whatever it doesn't really take that long so dusty smith you know after she does she's like okay well this is like way more ghosts and stuff than i can handle so she contacts Either a woman she knows or a woman that she researches, this uh, psychic who lives in Pennsylvania, whose name is Kelly Weaver. Now, Kelly Weaver's thing is that she can apparently get impressions of hauntings and things like that just from a photograph of the house. Now, the photograph has to only have the house in it. It can't have any people in it or cars or anything like that. So she says to Dusty, take some pictures of the house with no people in it. Send them to me. I'll hold them and see what kind of impressions I get. Don't tell me who lives there. Don't tell me anything about it. So Dusty does that. When Okay, so when the pictures get to Kelly's house, she doesn't do a reading on them right away, but she says as soon as she opens the envelope and looks at the picture, she says she gets a headache. She said, and that doesn't usually happen. She's like, so she knew it was going to be bad, and she kept like putting the reading off because she knew it was going to suck when she did it. So she doesn't do the reading right away. Meanwhile... A couple weeks later, Ed comes home from work and Beth and the baby are outside again. And, you know, she says, I just can't take it anymore. I can't be in this house. It's like, you know, I don't know what we're going to do. We have to move and all this other stuff. She's like, I don't, you know, at this point she's, you know, she's pregnant and she's like, I don't want to have another baby in this house. And it's just like the whole atmosphere of it is fucked up and I just can't. So Ed's like, we can't afford it. And And then, you know, they're fighting and still and just everything was just really stressful and all this other kind of crap. And then Beth also said that she noticed that their toddler daughter, Emily, was really um, irritable, like she wasn't getting any sleep. And so, you know, they thought that was kind of strange. So then Ed is like, it's been a while and Ed keeps calling Dusty going, you know, what's going on? It's like, are you guys, can you guys get rid of this stuff or whatever? Now, apparently, just like in the Amityville Horror, every time he's trying to call Dusty to get an update, like the phone keeps fucking up, like they keep losing the connection and stuff. And it wasn't a cell phone. It was a landline because it was 2001. You know, so he's getting frustrated. Beth said he's, he was getting to the point where he was just getting, not violent, but he was just, everything would set him off and he was just really crabby and all this other stuff. So finally, he gets hold of Dusty, says, I can't take it anymore. Just get over here, get rid of this shit and all this other stuff. Now, while he's on the phone yelling to Dusty, he hears that sound again. And there's somebody up on the roof. Now, he grabs a flashlight. He runs outside. He shines the flashlight up on On the the roof roof, and he saw a figure. Yeah, I talked to him about that. On the roof. Yeah. I asked him, I said, uh, I said, Ed, what was it you actually saw on the roof? And he kind of stuttered like... Dude, I don't even want to. I don't even want to talk about it. I I had the feeling he couldn't describe it. Yeah. And that it upset him, and that it, what it probably was was just kind of a a scary amorphous shape, kind of semi humanoid. I think all he said on the show was that it was a dark figure, quote yeah. unquote. Yeah. So yeah, he saw it running around the roof and started yelling at it and he stuff. He was trying like to that. hit it with a flashlight. Yeah. I'm not sure he actually got a good look on look at it based on his Yeah. I mean in the reenactment it was dark outside so right. I don't know. But right. he said he did see a dark figure on the roof. Right. And then he saw it in the beam of his flashlight. 
Now, evidently, while he was yelling at this thing on his roof, Dusty pulls up in the car and, you know, is like, you know, please don't yell at them. They don't like it. And, you know, it's not helping anything. So at this point, she says, well, we don't know what else to do. Um, You know, the Dunhams were not uh, a member of any church. So they said, well, maybe we should do just like a cleansing ourselves. We'll do the Native American sage thing. We could do some Christian prayers. Well, you know, as long as you believe in it, whatever, it's it'll work. She says, it'll take a couple days. We'll get everything set up and we'll come by and we'll do a cleansing on your house. And hopefully it will, it will work. Now, while Dusty's there, Beth says, you know, can you set up, use one of your cameras and set it up in uh, the baby's room? Because I don't think she's been sleeping and I don't know why. So as this is going on, they suddenly start hearing noises from the baby's Mm. room. And then the baby suddenly starts crying. You know, so they run down there. Now there's nobody in there, but the baby's just like seems really upset and disturbed and stuff like that. So... The Dunhams decided, well, let's put Emily in our room um, just to be on the safe side. But we're going to set up a camera on the crib to see if there's something keeping her awake. Yeah, this is where I start getting mad. Yeah. I start getting mad at this case about people who've seen this episode. And I imagine most people listening have seen this episode. What happens next just makes me mad. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So basically... The, like a day or two goes by, Dusty comes back, they do the cleansing and everything like that. And everything seems fine. Like after the cleansing, uh, Beth said, you know, the house felt a little bit better. It wasn't so oppressive and stuff like that. And they thought maybe it, things had been fixed. Meanwhile, this is a couple like after the cleansing, Dusty is there and she's like, oh, well, I'm, I'll switch out your videotape or whatever. Now she takes the videotape of the, you know, that was trained on the crib and she takes it back to the office and she's watching it. Now, she claims that on the videotape, there is, and they only show a reenactment, but she says that she heard a voice saying the baby's name and then saw, like, the there was a door, like, behind the crib and it opened by itself. And then there was, like, a dark figure, like, looming, like, over the crib. And then the baby started to cry. That's what they showed on the reenactment. And it was kind of, like, vague, like what Dusty said she saw on the tape. But it apparently alarmed her enough that she jumped right in the car and drove back to the Dunham's house to tell them to get the fuck out. Now, while she was driving to the house, she gets a phone call from the psychic in Pennsylvania who says, I've done the reading on the house, like the pictures that she got sent. They need to get the hell out of that house right now because there's something like really malevolent presence in there and it's after the baby. So Dusty drives back to the house and she basically runs in and she says, now, I don't think on the reenactment, I don't think she showed them the tape. She just they, said, you have to get out because of what's on this it's tape. It's my understanding the tape was never shown to anyone. Yeah. Which that that defies credulity to me. Yeah, that if seems If you kind hit of... the jackpot like that, you could become a very famous woman. Yeah. A very wealthy woman if you had that video. The claim is, is that it was not shown to anyone because they did not want to upset the family. If you ask me, I'm not buying it. My my trust in the investigative well, team... Well, I would want to see it. Yeah, my trust in the investigative team was, was shaken by this. All right? If that tape exists, it needs to be seen. Yeah. It just does. But I mean, apparently... And, and like I said, Ed and Beth on the show, and Dusty was on the show as well, you know, they didn't have any animosity toward her. They seemed like she, they said she was a very nice person yeah. and she came in and said, so well, they, I'm not saying she's not a nice yeah. person. Yeah. So, so I'm just saying that, that, but that, they that did, does not help yeah, parapsychology no. at all. No, it really doesn't. All right. But at any, but what I was leading up to is that they immediately, immediately believed her, evidently. Yeah. When she came in and said, what is on this tape that it's after your baby? You have to move out. You have to get out right now. Ed can probably chime in, you know, if he chimes in in the comments. I believe that, but I actually kind of believe that by the time that that ta- that this claim came to light, I kind of think that they were ready to get the hell out of there anyway. Maybe. I don't think it was just that. Well, that apparently, long. because it seemed they like there was so it. much tension right. in the house, and yeah. you know, it just seemed like every it seemed like everything was going to shit. They were fighting all right. the time. The baby wasn't sleeping. The baby was crabby and. It just seemed like a bad situation all yeah. around. Is there anything more? So, yeah, that was pretty much it. They right. they packed up their stuff. They got it. Now, in the reenactment, they showed while they were packing their stuff and running out of the house, the crib, like, flipped itself over. Right. None of them said that. Um, but, like I said, that's that's a problem that a haunting has is, like, they'll show stuff in the reenactment that nobody right. said or at least didn't say on camera. 
So, uh, so they moved. Do they, you want to hear my verdict? They got the hell out of the house. And that was pretty much the end of the story. They moved to another town and apparently uh, they got divorced later. But uh, You want to hear my verdict? Yeah, what's your verdict? Okay. Just based on the strength of Ed, his, Ed and Ed's character and the way he told me the story and what was actually said, and I guess you could say the flavor of talking, to, of talking with him, you know, I, he's a credible guy. There were witnesses, his family, you know, saw some of these disturbances. So I believe, I believe the family. Something scared them in that house. The problem I have is the investigative team. It was the way it was investigated was very much of the, of that era, of yeah. that time. Knowing what I know now, I probably would have sent a guy like Steve Merritt to the, to the house like that, which is a lot more low key. You're not dealing with a bunch of different people from different disciplines. You're dealing with one person who's trying to actually collect evidence because if they collected any evidence, they're not sharing it. Yeah. And that that doesn't that doesn't jive with me. You know what I mean? If you've got good evidence, as they claim, then it should be should have been shared with the rest of the it should have been shared with like and, the SPR. Or, well, and or shown ideally, to the public. if you're going to do an investigation on a place like that, you'd think that the team would want to like live in the house, yeah, or at least set up there for long periods of time instead of just you know a few hours here and there. Right, and I don't really, I don't, I wouldn't really uh, get involved with uh, psychics too much. It would just with cameras. Basically, yeah, is, is what I would deal with cameras in a controlled environment to, yeah. to see what's happening. But uh, you know, that was the way that was the way cases were investigated in in, the, in that time, and a lot of them are still investigated that way now on yeah. television. Yeah, you know, but that's that's not the good way to do it. In which uh, you know, but I do believe that the case happened, at yeah. least from the point of view of the family. I don't know what the what the investigators, you know, I don't know what they claim to have collected and seen. I don't know. Yeah. Where's this videotape? You know? Yeah, because, I mean, like Where's I said, apparently it was so upsetting yeah. that... Where's the readings off of all these EMF meters? Yeah. Which, you know, Steve will tell you, Steve Merrill will tell you those EMF meters don't mean all that much. You have to use them the right way. Yeah. You can't just walk around waving that thing around. There's, there's electromagnetic fields everywhere in the house. Yeah. It doesn't really mean much. Well, the whole you reason that they... U- with that actual like real quote-unquote parapsychologists use them is because they're trying to get a base a baseline line reading so right. they can see where all the appliances are causing emf right. readings and all so they know if something strange right. happens that it's not attributable right. to natural causes i think it was a well-meaning investigation i just don't think it was effective by today's standards yeah and like I said, I guess it wasn't effective. They didn't because collect it doesn't, any evidence. They didn't share well, any evidence. one, they didn't so. collect any evidence. And two, the family ended up moving ahead and right, having yeah. to move out anyway. Right. What, you know, whether it was because the haunting was really as bad as as the uh, team made it seem or because they were just sick of it. At well, what was the motive? If it was a hoax, out. if it was a hoax, what was the motive? I would you not. Know? No, I don't think it was. Yeah, hoax. I don't think it was a hoax either because there, there was no motive. I'm just saying I mean, that the only possible motive is maybe Ed was trying to skip out on his lease, but I find that unlikely. Yeah. Why would they put themselves through all that shit? That's what. Yeah, that's what, you I, know mean. what I mean. No. Well, yeah, and I mean, in a lot of cases, you know, I'm willing to concede, like some cases, you know, maybe it was just misidentification or something like that. Yeah, some cases are hoaxes, but most of the time, why would you bother? It just seems like too much trouble. It was a bad. I guess it was unless a bad, you're making a shit ton of money, which which he wasn't. So. I guess it was a bad house. Yeah. But I knew where it was. I rode out there. This is a long time later. And there's people living in it now, you know what I mean? And I just kind of stopped outside of it and looked at it and see if I could feel any feelings from it. I couldn't. It was just like a normal house. Yeah. Oh, this is how I met Ed Dunham. Yeah. I went up to Ace Hardware to go buy some fasteners. I was building something for a motorcycle. And a guy helping me find these Allen, uh, Allen bolts, you know. I'm, uh, I'm looking at him because, boy, this guy sounds really familiar. And I looked down at his nameplate, and it was said Ed with two D's. Yeah. I went, man, that's Ed Dunham, because I had just seen yeah. the haunting in Florida case on the haunting maybe like a few weeks before. Yeah. And that was when I got interested in that case. And uh, it was, I guess that was two thousand what, maybe ten. Well, no, it was no because. Had been after that, huh? Yeah. Well, because we yeah. haven't lived here. Oh, that's right. We were living here at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Because, right. yeah, because the Ace Hardware is only right, right, right okay, up around so the corner. Okay, so that had only been maybe three years ago. Yeah, maybe. so that was only maybe three or four years ago. Because we've yeah. only lived here for, what, five or six years. Yeah. So uh, it couldn't have been that long ago. Yeah. He didn't know me from Adam, but I, you know, we instantly started talking Army. And then I, t- I told him real quick, I said, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, there, that you had written a book about me called the uh, Math Mountain Poltergeist. And uh, I asked if I could talk to him uh, over Facebook. He's like, yeah. So I got his... Uh, Hooked up with him on Facebook, called him on the phone, talked to him a few times. I tried to get him to come on the show the other day, 
But uh, he's still working construction. He says it's wearing him out. He was he was feeling sorry for himself. He says, "Oh, I'm getting old, man. I'm getting old. This work's killing me." But uh, yeah, he's still a good guy. Yeah, broke up with his wife. He's on his own now. You know, it's just it's it. It was so weird to me that of all the people to run into, like you run into him just at yeah. You go to Ace Hardware and then and then like, like <laughs> and then like a year later I was on my like, bike hey. and then like a year later I was, I was on my bike full armor. At a red light, turned over and looked. Ed was in the car next to me. Yeah, and I go, "What's up, Eddie?" And he goes, "That's you." <laughs> <laughs> so he yeah. must live really close by then. I think he did at that time. I don't think he lives in this area too much anymore. I could ask him. But yeah, so he's he, close by. But yeah, so he lives like right close here. Close by. So that's just that's very funny. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely. I mean, I do think that there's something to. And like I said, other than seeing apparitions, nothing super super out there. No demons. No nothing like that. Well, yeah, well not on really. The roof. Things banging. Uh, apparitions. Cabinets opening. Apparitions. Weird yeah. noises. The typical things that are reported. Up, like yeah. feelings of oppression are being watched and stuff like that, yeah. which is pretty common. Tip- pretty common for haunting. Low yeah. level haunting. Just interesting because of the yeah. uh, of the apparitions that kind of occurred right out of the gate. Yeah, and then it almost seemed like the poltergeist stuff happened after that, which right. is kind of unusual because usually it ramps up to. I wouldn't really call it poltergeist. There wasn't anything that moved; just sounds. Well, the cabinet doors. Oh, that's right. And that's the right. shower. About that. Yeah, that's right. So that is a poltergeist type effect. Yeah, but that's sometimes reported in haunting. True. Where there's kind of a gray, yeah, there's a lot of overlap. I guess gray overlap. Yeah. Okay, hope you enjoyed that uh, breakdown of another episode of A Haunting. I like doing these, actually. Yeah, maybe we'll have to have Ed on sometime. He's yeah, ready. yeah, he, 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 right. he can uh, be a guest on the show. That would be yeah. actually be pretty cool. He seems like a really cool guy. And uh, so, as always, if you like the show, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and all that good stuff. Also, go to www.zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock, and there are some t-shirts there that you can have if you want. Also, another shout-out to the Project Entertainment Network and Armand Rosamilia, who is uh, running our blog network here. Check them, check them out. They have, like, a bunch of other really cool shows that I'm sure you will enjoy. And uh, also give to their Patreon, because they have, like, a bunch of cool swag that you can have uh, including a bunch of postcards of our uh, of our podcast that we signed yeah so autograph stuff yeah we have <laughs> we autograph them yeah. you guys there's also magnets and stuff right, like what that. song are you gonna close out with i'm actually you know what because it's a florida haunting yeah i said well i'm just gonna use that as an excuse to use the grim grinning ghost song from the haunted mansion okay <laughs> so be sure to tune in next tuesday bye Creak and the tombstones quake. Spooks of mockers wait and wait. Happy haunts materialize. And begin to vocalize. Grim, grim ghosts about to socialize.